And now I'm very pleased to welcome Dr. Mike Willis. Uh, he is both an adjunct assistant research professor at University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and a research associate at Cornell. He did his postdoctoral work at Cornell and at the Bird Polar Research Center in Ohio State. And he's interested in looking at the contributions of Earth's ice sheets and glaciers to sea level change. And just two interesting facts about Mike. He's been to Antarctica 12 times and the Arctic twice. He's a very hardy soul. <laughs> and uh, in 2008, the U.S. Board of Geographic Names named a ridge after him in Antarctica. Uh, U.S. Ridge. <laughs> so can you find it on Google Maps? <laughs> <laughs> so welcome, Mike. Entitled Scientific Progress Goes Point. Um, Bill Walterson with Calvin Hobbes did a, a lovely, gentle uh, representation of science through these cartoons. If you can get these cartoons, there's lots of good stuff about how science should work, doesn't work, does work, and what society thinks of it. So I thought it was an appropriate title to look at how the Earth goes boink when you load it with a mass or take a mass away. So, um, if you're interested, uh, during my times in Antarctica and Greenland, I took quite a lot of photos. If you Google polar.mike, you'll find a, a lot of my photos online where the first hit generally comes from Google. And if you ever use Google Earth and look around and click on photos in Antarctica, you'll find a lot of them that have been uh, taken by myself. So, scientific process, progress goes boink. I'm going to talk about some of the questions and motivations why I'm looking at what I'm looking at, uh, the methods used, the findings, and what next. And I'm going to concentrate mostly on Greenland, just because, well, to be blunt, Greenland's easier. Antarctica is still a very complicated problem. Uh, the problems in Antarctica are due to the ice there changing just now and having a big long-term memory. So I'll cover what that means. A little, bit, a little bit later, whereas Greenland itself is, the signals are so large, what we measure is so large that it's pretty compelling. So it's, a, it's an easier story. Some of you remember, might remember this little gem from Donald Rumsfeld, which I feel is practically zen. <laughs> there are known knowns. These are things that we know that we know. There are known unknowns. <laughs> That is to say, these are things that we know that we don't know. But there are also unknown unknowns. These are things that we don't know that we don't know. <laughs> now to break this down. No knowns. I'm going to call them facts. Could have said there are facts. Then there are known unknowns. I'm going to call those questions. And then there are things we don't know we don't know. I'm going to call them surprises. So he could have said to me, there are facts, questions, and surprises. And people would have walked away knowing what he was actually talking about. <laughs> this is an unknown unknown. Just now, our knowledge of the polar ice sheets, the great ice sheets of Antarctica and Greenland, are kind of somewhere between the second and the third of it. We've got some facts, but we've got an awful lot of questions. And we've got an awful lot of surprises. Every time we look at an ice sheet closely, Richard Alley of Penn State has said this before. Every time we look at it, an ice sheet closely, we find something new that surprises us, which means that we don't yet fully understand the ice sheets, and there's a lot more research to be done. So that's the kind of state of knowledge just now. So some of the known knowns, or some of the known unknowns, or the things that get me out of bed and get me doing the work that I do. How are the great ice sheets contributing to accelerated sea level? and can we use earth deformation to weigh the ice sheets? So I'm going to talk through two or three different techniques that we put together to answer these questions, but this is just a really photogenic GPS site that we installed in southern Greenland. So I'm going to cover GPS, the Global Positioning System. I'm going to cover stuff from a satellite system called GRACE, which is the Gravity Recovery Climate Experiment. And I'm going to cover some of the stuff that actually my, my, uh, Andrew, um, who's a student who works with, a PhD, 
uh, work on with a digital elevation model differencing, which is getting representations of the topography of the Earth and watching them evolve through time and what that tells us about the Earth and about ice. So, no knowns, some facts, some motivations. The polar regions are warming at a rate 7 to 10 times faster than the global average over the last 30 years. Just now we've had cold weather down in North Carolina and oh, you know, the sky is falling, the sky is falling, climate change can't be real. It's been 15 to 20 Celsius warmer than average for January and February in the Arctic. So the, the great cold that we're getting down south is rather nicely balanced by great warmth that's occurring up in the Arctic. Uh, the January sea ice in the Arctic is about 80% of the size that it should have been compared to the last 30 years. So sea ice is disappearing um, in the Arctic. Uh, in the Antarctic, it's not such a problem. But in general, the Arctic and Antarctic regions are warming faster than everywhere else. <laughs> sea level's going up. Uh, sea level was going up about a millimeter per half per year. But the 1993 to 2009 average, and this number is even slightly larger now, uh, is 3.2 kilometers per year, so a tenth of an inch or so. And that acceleration has generally been the last you know, two to three decades where that's occurred. Uh, we get that from time gauges, and we get that from satellite altimetry around the world. Why do we care that sea level is going up? Uh, one tenth of the Earth's population uh, lives within 10 meters of sea level. 66% of the global population lives within 10 <coughs> meters of sea level. Well, sea level is not going to go up that high in the The, by far, the densest populated counties in the USA are coastal. And many coastal cities, London would be a good one, and the Netherlands of the New York City, Washington DC, or some not worry about that so much, can't really tolerate a, a rise of two meters. Two meters aren't, isn't on the cards for the next hundred years or so, but take the 200 years, 300 years, two meters is going to be something which uh, is probable for a lot of coastal cities. And we were talking earlier about what happens when an ice sheet collapses. Well, if you remove ice in Antarctica, you got some things, so the land bounces back up, which displaces water, but you also have a gravitational effect. So just now the mass of ice in Greenland or Antarctica pulls water together just due to the gravitational effect. If you remove that ice sheet, the gravity drops and that water flows away. So close to an ice sheet, the immediate response of the ocean when ice disappears is that sea level drops. But Jeremy Trevica, who's at Harvard, has, has done some really cool modeling of this. And he's found that if the ice disappears from West Antarctica, then stuff on the eastern seaboard is going to go up between 30 and 50% faster than the global average. So if it goes up a meter on the globe, it'll go up a meter 30 to a meter 50 on the eastern seaboard of the USA. If Greenland were to disappear, or a lot of the mass were lost from Greenland, that would kind of be reflected down, east, down in southeast America. It's called a sea level fingerprinting. But it basically means that you can't just take the global average of, oh, sea level's going up here, sea level's going up there. There's lots of complications with rotational feedback, with gravity, <coughs> with the crust adjusting to the different loads. They generally mean that the east coast of the USA is not somewhere particularly wonderful when it comes to sea level rise as it's occurring around the west. I sometimes do this to annoy people. Ditch the South Florida beaches. <laughs> Ditch it if you're going to buy one. It's not a good investment. Uh, this is five meters of sea level rise, which will take you all up through the Everglades. And Miami's gone. Downtown Miami is only about uh, two feet, three feet above sea level, two to two and a half feet above sea level. So we don't even have to get a meter of sea level rise and your property values for the financial district in downtown Miami go through the floor. So again, not your greatest investment opportunity for those who are young, and you might want to hold on to it if you're, you're getting it all. NASA disappears as well. 
when, uh, when sea level goes up in South Florida. We do have some secret weapons for answering what's going on with sea level, what's going on with ice mass changes in the polar regions. And this is, this is the uh, schematic cartoon of uh, the GRACE satellite pair. Two really weird looking trapezoid satellites that follow each other. They're separated <coughs> by about, I think it's about 200 kilometers, and they fire a radar beam between the two of them. And what they do is, as you measure the distance between the two satellites, as one of them goes over the mass, it gets pulled forward a little bit. And the other one, which is further behind in the orbit, stays back. So you get a distance that increases between the two satellites. As that second satellite passes over that mass, it speeds up a little bit and catches up with the first satellite. So you have these two satellites that are kind of bouncing backwards and forwards. It's like the Tour de France. You know, the person goes out in front, sometimes they catch him up, sometimes he takes off his window hill, and sometimes they catch him up again. Yeah. But by measuring the distance between the two satellites, you can exquisitely decide how much mass is underneath the satellites. I mean, it's a beautiful, beautiful, elegant system. But it can only tell you the mass underneath you. Now, what happens is it orbits, and about once a month, it goes over the same place. So once a month, you get a measure of what the mass is beneath the system. So through time, you can see if this mass changes. And this has become really useful for measuring changes in water, basically. Water in any of its forms, in, uh, in rivers, in oceans, in lakes, or as we're interested, with ice. So this is what Grace sees between 2003 and 2010. And this is uh, changed into uh, centimeters of ice being lost. So you can see that occasionally there's some ice being added, but wow, 2005, the southeast of Greenland really starts losing mass. And that up through 2010, it's that mass loss has spread up into the northwest of Greenland. Um, what we have to decide is what's causing this mass loss? Because this exquisite sensor, sensor is measuring it, but what's causing it? And you've got two things going on. You've got ice moving faster into the oceans, <coughs> and you've got changes in the amount of snow and ice being deposited on the ice sheet. So we call that dynamics, is the ice changing its speed. And you've got surface mass balance, which is the amount of snow that's added and removed from the top of the ice sheet each year. <coughs> so with that, we can kind of weigh the great ice sheets, but there's a problem. Earth does actually go boink as you add mass and take mass away from the ice sheets, underneath the ice sheet, the mantle and the crust responds. And that's a mass that Grace can tell you the mass changes, but it can't tell you what the mass change is caused by. So it could be a mix-up of ice changes and mantle changes. And so we have to correct this sensor through time using pretty complicated models which is what Sam's going to get into. And it's going to cause you time. He's going to take your entire PhD. I'm sorry, but it's going to take your entire PhD for sort of time. <laughs> so you have two sorts of signals. You have the sort of signal that reacts now. I'm going to stand here. The Earth is going to bend underneath me. Maybe not too much, but the Earth is going to bend underneath me. But if I stand here long enough, I'm going to stay further and further and further, and the mantle is going to move away too. If I remove myself, the crust is going to come back up. And what we found is it's going to come up pretty fast. And then the mantle, which is very much denser than ice, is going to fall back into that space. And that's a mass change. And Grace can tell you that there, those things are occurring, but it can't tell you this proportion is caused by this and this proportion is caused by that. So we're going to look at that elastic deformation, say year after year after year, we can see ice being added and taken away by surface mass balance and dynamics. What can we measure with 
GPS on the ground in these places? And then how do we take those elastic signals, those long-term physical elastic signals, put them together, and actually get a handle on what the great ice sheets are doing? The other thing to do that is we need to install GPS everywhere. We've installed 55 GPS in Greenland, and as of last week, we're at about 55 GPS in Antarctica on bedrock. And then we need them to record every 15 or every 30 seconds for years and years and years before we can get a good handle on it. And your issue there is it's dark in the winter. Where do you get the power from? I'll go back to that in a second. So, grace is this wonderful thing, but do we have a fall from grace? Uh, we know there are questions about it, as I said. It has no vertical resolution. All it can tell you is beneath the satellite, mass is changing. It can't tell you where or what directly below you that mass is. So, it can't tell you if it's caused by changing ice or something below, above, or even beside the ice change. It's also got pretty poor horizontal resolution. I showed you that map of the, the blue spreading out over Greenland. That's made up from pixels, which are maybe about 300 kilometers across. So, you know, half from here to, what's 300 kilometers? Here to Buffalo? Would that be 300 kilometers? Yeah, 120, 150 miles. So, the pretty big coarse resolution. Temporally, they're really high, but spatially, they smear things out in big, big areas. Which, what I say is good for somewhere like Greenland or Antarctica, but I'll, I'll show you some caveats to that later on. It's definitely not very good for really small ice masses, which when you add up the really small ice masses, they actually have a, an appreciable signal too. So the little diagram down at the bottom here is just a, a, a little uh, movie, animation, of ice building up during the last glacial maximum. As that happens, the Earth is pushed down. As the ice disappears, and we go into an interglacial or you know, a warming event where the ice is okay, building up, the mantle moves out of the way and the crust moves down. And then as it shrinks, the crust moves back up and the mantle moves in. We put GPS kind of around the edges of it. So, what is GIA is Glacial Isostatic Adjustment, which is the correction we need to put to that gray satellite to get a real handle on what's happening now and what's, what signals we're getting now are due to the past. GIA is affected by the history of the ice sheet, where the ice sheet was, how long it sat there, how long it took to disappear. It's affected by just how thick the elastic part of the lithosphere is. It's really affected by uh, the upper mantle viscosity, or how sticky or fluid the upper mantle is, how easily it can move out of the way. The lower mantle viscosity. Of these, though, the, the largest uncertainty comes back to we don't really know well where the ice was at what time in the past. Ice sheets have this horrible, um, when, you, when you put a glacier somewhere and it comes forward and leaves you this beautiful record and then it retreats and you get this beautiful record, you can go and do proxy stuff, you can go do paleoclimatology on all these records. They have a habit of then re-advancing and going over the top of all the signals that you wanted to record. So you can, it's very hard to get long-term signals from what an ice sheet has done around the edges or even in the middle of it. People say we've got all these beautiful ice cores. We do have beautiful ice cores. We've got about 20 of them in total. For something, you know, the, the Antarctic ice sheet is the size of the USA plus Mexico. So we've got 20 little points where we can tell you <laughs> what happened there, what happened everywhere else. We're, we're still trying to figure Again, one of the known unknowns. This is a really rather crude <coughs> now uh, reconstruction of what Antarctica looked like 20,000 years ago. This kind of reconstruction changes on what seems to be a daily basis. Um, more and more uh, 
recent publications are saying that the amount of ice that East Antarctica and West Antarctica had 10,000, 20,000 years ago is less and less and less and less. Antarctica doesn't seem to be responsible for so much of the sea level change that we can see from paleo records over the last 10,000 years as we thought. But this reconstruction, for example, was constrained with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten data points, approximately. And we now know that these four are wrong. <laughs> so we modeled all of this, all of this mass change here in East Antarctica and all of this mass change over here in West Antarctica based on that. And that's the issue in Antarctica is where are you going to get these records? You're going to get it from these 20 or so ice cores, or are you going to get them from bedrock? Now, USA plus Mexico, bedrock's Delaware. 2% of the continent isn't covered by ice. So there's very limited places where you can actually get these records. But we're trying, we're getting better. We think most of the ice change is actually now through here in the southern White L Sea and a little bit through here in the, the southern Ross Sea, places where we actually can't get very many proxy records, unfortunately. Then you have, so you have for GIA, you have the ice history and then the Earth's mechanical properties. We call that the rheology, another known unknown. And we're looking at the stickiness of the upper mantle, part of matters. Um, when you have very big changes, they're felt by the lower mantle. Um, but the upper mantle feels a lot of stuff at the GPS more easily than the The response of the Earth depends on the scale and the duration of the load, how long the ice sits there. And those responses for the long-term changes and the short-term changes uh, are superposed on top of each other. So, measuring the point with GPS. Uh, most people now are pretty familiar with what GPS is. It's a military satellite system. US uh, Air Force started launching it in the late 80s and early 90s. It uses triangulation. Uh, you need four satellites in view at once to get a three dimensional fix. This is a, a schematic. You've got satellite two here, satellite three here, satellite one. You're guessing that you actually need a four satellite to get an idea on your timing on, and on which side of the Earth you're actually on. Um, we use things that you don't get in your car. Ours are typically about 10 grand each. Uh, so 55 of them, you're starting to add up uh, what you've got. They're good to a millimeter accuracy. Um, the way I like to illustrate that is if you dropped a quarter and it got lodged in the sand and we went and positioned it, we could say it's there. If we came back 10 years later and we went to the same place, that quarter wouldn't be there. It would have moved because the plate has moved. So it, it, we're good enough to measure, okay, there's the edge of the quarter there, there's the edge of the quarter there. That's how far the plate has moved in the intervening 10 years. So these are, are yeah, they're stupidly accurate. And they're, they're very complicated to deal with, and they're very expensive to build. But we do get to go and vandalize some really beautiful places. <laughs> how do we install them? Uh, Sikorsky S26 helicopters are a pretty good start. Uh, it can carry the number of batteries in northern Greenland and in southern parts of Antarctica. We have stations which have 26 deep cycle marine batteries like you put on your boat. Uh, so they're about 60 or 70 pounds each. And I was basically hired to carry batteries up mountains. That <laughs> <laughs> was my PhD and masters. Um, yeah. It's cold work, it's hard work, but again, we get to go, go to some beautiful spots. Uh, this is a, a typical system. This is a uh, Eastern Greenland. We've got uh, four solar panels, uh, a bank of batteries here, and sometimes we'll have a wind generator. And the reason we've got so many solar panels and so many batteries is this is the Arctic Bay. 24 hour sunlight, we're getting loads of sun coming in, we can do real time communications with these things, I can look them up on my phone. And this is now. Not so much when it comes to solar power, it's dark depending on the latitude for up to six months of the year. But we've been very successful. Um, said many, very heavy batteries. This one will have 12 batteries in here, and eight batteries in each of those. So a couple of little wind generators, which are experimental, and have turned into the bane of my existence during this project. <laughs> Four watts. 
4 watts doesn't sound like a lot. 4 watts, 4 watts of power, we're not going to bother with it. We're not going to put a regulator on it because it's only 4 watts. 4 watts can't do any damage to a battery system like this, can it? 4 watts, if you have 100 mile an hour winds for a month, blows your system to pieces. <laughs> and we come back to find little bits of other things that are going point spread over the landscape. So we now have regulators on those. And they seem to work okay. An exam. Here's some of the big batteries. We were using this really high tech aerogel nano foam insulation, the JPL design, and then someone decided that they would just slice off bits of the styrofoam that you put in your home insulation instead. So <laughs> instead of having you know four thousand dollar boxes, these boxes are about a thousand dollars each, and the styrofoam is only a few cents. And that keeps the systems warm enough to run even through the coldest winters. We've had these run down to minus 70 degrees Celsius. And they've ran without, without a problem. Just lots and lots of them. We have a GPS receiver here. And then this is a satellite modem. So as I said, we can look up these things that they broadcast in real time. If you go to the polnet.org page or the NAFCO page, you can have a look at the data that's coming off these uh, with a, a one-day delivery. Beautiful places. Problems not so much in Antarctica. Problems in Antarctica have been due to static, but problems in Greenland have been a little unique. Uh, these things stand about seven or eight feet tall. We have little antennas way up here, and we come back to find tooth marks <laughs> where the bear has been on its side, <laughs> biting on them. These things are drilled about two feet into bedrock with four really hefty bedrock pins. So you want that antenna to be really stable. When it's going up, you want it to tell you the landscape is going up. When it's going sideways, you want it to tell you the landscape is going sideways. What you don't want it to tell you is the polar bear goes, this is a nice stretching post. <laughs> so, that's a, somewhere we come in, they've just been destroyed. Winds we've had, these are decently thick pieces of plastic and it looks as though somebody shot them. It's not been, it's just the wind picking up rocks and throwing them through the air. Uh, we had uh, one site, installed in Antarctica where the, the team who was at the same place a year later came out of their tent to see snowmobiles flying away at head height due to the wind. So the wind picks things up and throws them around in the polar regions. The embarrassing one is we've had lemmings and hares have decided to destroy our systems. They find that they can chew through the electric cables. You've got 26 fully charged deep cell batteries behind that. We find bits of lemmings and bits of hair <laughs> in the neighborhood, <laughs> nice and crispy. Uh, <laughs> <same>. uh, <laughs> it smells. <laughs> well, th see, this this one actually did. This one got beaten up by a polar bear, and this one's at about two and a half thousand feet above sea level. And we thought we're at the top of these cliffs; nothing's going to come up here <laughs> and hassle them. Unfortunately, female polar bears, <coughs> once they've had their their cubs in the spring. Don't go anywhere near the sea ice because that's where the males are, and the males eat the cubs. So the females come up to high altitude, crossing over really crevassed glaciers, and this thing probably smells like bacon to them. You know, in the high Arctic, there's not many swells, smells. So to smell this, they're just like, what's that? And they go and have a good, nice investigation, which causes us sixty to seventy thousand dollars worth of damage. So <laughs> we have to go and fix it. And uh, we have Danish colleagues here, like, we can just polar, proof, polar bear proof them. And we're like, well, what does that involve? Well, you put a fence out, and it's got barbed wire, and razor wire, and it's got bangers and smashers. And, and we're like, and how heavy is that? Oh, it'll be, you know, seven or eight hundred pounds worth of gear. And, like, and how much <coughs> is the helicopter to carry seven or eight hundred pounds of gear? And it just ends up that we put them out. And, Cross our fingers, and we generally accept we lost three or four of them, but out of 55, that's that's not bad going. One side, we I'm vehemently opposed to them putting it back in again. They keep on replacing it in the same place, but the bear obviously knows it's there. That was the scratch and post one. But uh, oh well. <laughs> so these GPS, we get time series of east-west motion and time series of up-down motion through time. And they often make these kind of sinusoids. And for the longest time, doing geodesy, 
I mean, I started doing journalism in 97, 96, 97. And for the longest time, we're like, this stuff's noise. It's getting in the way. It's, it's bugging us. We have to just remove it. It's not telling us anything. In 2001, there was a Japanese geologist called Heike, who he started looking at how these things are bouncing in the up and looking at the local snow loads in western Japan, and he found a one-to-one -one correlation. Snow falling next to this system, the system went down. Snow melting next to the system, the system went up. And it became clear that these oscillations are at least partly caused by local loads changing around the GPS. Uh, this is Mike Davis, who uh, I work with still on these projects, especially in Greenland. He had a GPS system at Manaus in the central the Amazon basin in South America. And there's a big flood wave that comes down the Amazon, a big tidal or reverse tidal bore, I guess, that water comes from this direction, where the, the stage of the river goes up about 12 meters very, very quickly. And as the water goes up, GPS goes down. As the water goes down, the GPS goes up. And he showed pretty convincingly that you can you can measure these elastic deformations due to hydrology, at least in this part of South America. Um, so glaciers, do they do they give you elastic responses? This is a glacier that's kind of hard to see in this light, unfortunately. It flows down here down here, and this is where the front of the glacier was in 2001. This is in western uh, southern Patagonia. This is nine years later in February 2010, and there's the outline where the glacier was, and here's the front of the glacier now. So it's gone back, it's uh, four kilometers of ice has been destroyed, and the vertical is 450 meters of ice difference. Empire State Building is 450 meters tall. So in nine years, it lost the thickness of the Empire State Building at that point. You can be very, very sure that the bedrock next to this is springing up in response to that. And we will try yet again this summer to get funded to go and put GPS in to measure that. We're not, we're not back on that proposal once already. So just, uh, is this going to work? Yes, so this is the Columbia Glacier between 2006 and I think 2012, 2010 maybe, uh, from the Extreme Ice Survey, which is a, uh, you might have seen Chasing Ice, it was the film that James Baylock put together using this, this sort of footage. And so the glacier going back like this isn't the biggest, biggest signal, because as the glacier goes back, you can see the water fills in where the glacier was. So in terms of a mass, that's not really important. This glacier is probably floating already. It's not really at the sea level. What we're more interested in is these trim lines along the edges of the glacier where this ice was sitting on the earth, and now it's gone into the ocean. It's got a lot thinner. And that's a kind of watch it deflating there. My cursor is for my pointer is where the edge of the ice used to be. And that's probably several tens of meters, which is the sort of signal that the GPS will, will pick up as an elastic response fairly easily. Okay, this is a, a brain bender of a diagram. <laughs> the site that gets eaten by polar bears is here. The other site that gets eaten by polar bears is here, so there's no arrows for those ones strangely <laughs> enough. <laughs> What we found in Greenland, and this is, let's have a look at Thule 2. Here's Thule 2. What we found in Greenland is this is what the ice used to do. Or this is what the GPS did. You know, like GPS used to do. Yeah, it was kind of doing nothing, just annual cycle. And then about 2003, 2004, it started getting a bit faster. And 2006, 2007, it started going a bit faster still. So there's a bend to this trajectory that you wouldn't expect. It's going up faster. Ilulisat, down here, I'll show a longer time series from that in a second, it's doing the same. Kulusuk, down here, going up faster. A lot of these sites are going up faster than they used to do. And we actually can take this back down to almost, a, in fact, a yearly level, and say if we know what the long-term behavior of these sites are, 
we can predict where it is in here, and then we can have a look at the difference with where it is compared to the, the, the average. And what we're showing here is this is a map of what's called the melt data anomaly for 2010 in Greenland. So where it's very, very red, it melted 60 days longer than the 30-year average in 2010. And you can see that the GPS at those sites are springing up. Where it didn't melt any longer than usual, or just slightly longer than usual, the GPS isn't doing anything. So we're really pretty accurately being able to measure what the melt is doing in Greenland, the surface mass balance, with the GPS. And this was 2010. So this is 2010 over here. This was July 2012, or July 8th. And this is four days later. And these are pixels of, of melt. And we've not seen this before. Uh, 2013 was nowhere near this sort of coverage of melt. But basically in 2012, the entire of Greenland at some point melted which even up to the highest elevations, you know, 3,000 meters above sea level. 2013, this was a lot smaller. 2014, putting my neck out here, I expect it to be kind of 2012-ish based on what we've seen already in the last two months, although that could change. So we're getting all these bounces in the GPS signal. So this is each station, this is what we do on average per year. Um, we looked at that and then we looked at GRACE, and GRACE gives an independent measure. So this is what the bedrock's doing in the up. We looked at GRACE and GRACE was telling us this is what the mass changes are, and they didn't, they didn't match. They were shifted in phase. So we got this blue line, pardon me, we got this red line for what on average a GPS site at the edge of Greenland does each year. And then we looked at Grace and we just we said, okay, what does Grace do? Grace is this thick dotted line here. And you can see it doesn't really match the red line. Uh, and Mike and I sat and talked about this for a very long time. And we came out with this dotted line. This dotted line is the weather systems on average for Greenland throughout the year. And we added the two together, and we got the blue line. And what that's telling us is the GPS are measuring the mass change caused by changes in the ice, the ice melting, and the mass change caused by the average weather at the GPS site. So as a high pressure system comes over, the GPS sinks. As a low pressure system comes over, the GPS rises. So we're actually measuring weather with, by measuring the elastic response of the surface of the Earth, which, that was an unknown unknown. This was a surprise to us that we got this. And this is not big numbers. These are, what, six? So this is 10 millimeters, so a centimeter, uh, half an inch. But there's a half inch oscillation, on average, at a GPS site in Greenland, caused by ice mass changes plus the weather, which we need to understand both of those in order to back out all these long-term signals. So I'm just going to go a little tour around bits of Greenland, and what we found, so there's, there's four stations here, I'm not even going to pronounce it, but like KK because I can't pronounce it, Godhav, and that's the, that's the Danish name, that one. Asiat, Alulisat, and Kaga is effectively Jakobshavn which is the glacier which they say sank Titanic is the glacier that's been in the news recently for just going super, super fast. So if we take a profile along that, those GPS sites, we get the site that's on the coast there over the last you know, six or seven years, each year has been going up faster. So in year one, it, say it was zero. In year two, it was going up 1.2 millimeters per year. In year three, it was going up 2.4 year three, it was going up 3.6 millimeters per year. Year four, it was going up 4.8 millimeters per year. So it's accelerating at 1.2 millimeters per year upwards 
ASEAN, a little closer, 1.75 millimeters per year. Elilisat, almost 2.4 millimeters per year. And uh, the site which is right next to the calving front, where the thinning is occurring, Yakutov, is going up 3.6 millimeters per year faster every year. So this is just a constant acceleration that's occurring. And that's due to the mass loss that's occurring as Jakob's Harbor gets faster and faster and faster, and thinner and thinner and thinner. Actually, in all of our GPS sites around Greenland, this rather unsupposing one down here in Kellyville, which is where the, the main American research takes place, is going up at a, an accelerated rate faster than anything else. Because when we first started these surveys, that was going down. So the system there was going down through time, and as, as we get closer and closer to present, it's now swapped its direction, and it's now going up at two and a half uh, millimeters per year. And that's actually fairly gratifying, because this is GRACE. This is a GRACE map from 2003 through 2010 of accelerations. And you can see this, this bullseye of faster acceleration going on in the southwest, which is nice. The thing with Kellyville is there's no glaciers that go into the oceans there. All the glaciers end up on the land. So you can't have glaciers going faster at Kellyville to give you the ice changes. So all the changes that are going on in Kellyville are purely due to accelerated melting or a change in the amount of snow that's falling year after year after year. Again, this is just a, an example of the sort of time series that we get from the GPS. And down here in the southeast, which is my, my personal, probably my favorite place on the planet, uh, it's just gorgeous there, less polar bears, which is good. <laughs> this one got eaten by the polar bear, so not completely free. Um, in southeast Greenland, we get a mix. We've got sites that are going down, this one up here, Kua, and Kangalushua Glacier, and this site down here at Kiba. Uh, they're going down year after year at a faster and faster rate. Whereas mixed in with those, we've got sites which are going up pretty quickly year after year after year. And you can see Grace here just says that everything should be slowing down. And that's just, this was another unknown unknown. Grace says that you should have just slowing down glaciers in southeast Greenland. But we've definitely got, we've got some, some glaciers slowing down and some glaciers speeding up. And it's just the resolution, it's just the horizontal resolution of grace. Everything over a 300, 300 kilometer pixel smears out the fact that some glaciers here are shooting off into the ocean and some glaciers are doing nothing. So this is actually providing more information on top of grace to say that on a basin level or a glacier by glacier by glacier level, things are much more complicated than we saw, thought. Which has led us to all take a bit of a step back because Grace has been the benchmark. Grace has been, Grace is telling us what the Arctic or Antarctic is doing. This is saying Grace isn't telling us the full story. And it is saying that if we're smart with where we put the GPS and then if NASA and National Science Foundation decide to keep paying for these things running, we can actually weigh the ice sheet in a matter that's complementary to Grace and lets us uh, make even finer scale measurements of the mass changes. So the variability of acceleration in southeast Greenland is striking. We've got some sites going down, some sites going up, and it's smeared out by grace. And some things are going to be caused by uh, atmospheric changes, the amount of snow, the amount of ice, and others are going to be uh, caused by the changes in the speeds of so this Kangalushua glacier is a really big glacier, Helheim glacier, really big glacier. They were thought for the longest time to be the main methods that Greenland gets ice from the interior into the ocean. Jakobs Haven is the other one, which is over here. Um, I was at a meeting a couple of weeks ago that I've always, I have to say this, I've always said that this little unassuming glacier down in southeast Greenland is a monster putting lots and lots of mass into the ocean. Vindicated. <laughs> it showed that out of the big three, these ones are third and fourth, and this guy's second, in terms of mass throughput into the ocean. So, but this one's slowing, 
and this one's slowing, but these ones around here are speeding still. And Greece just can't show it. So going up to northeast Greenland, uh, basically everywhere's accelerating, all of them are getting faster year after year after year. This might be the next area where Greece sees that mass that came up to the west coast is going to be going across the top. And this is a, a little bit interesting because this particular ice stream, most of its base is below sea level, so it has the capability of shoving uh, more ice into the ocean faster than we thought. I'm working with some colleagues up at Buffalo to look at that a little bit closer. So this map is probably the one we're going to look at. This is, this is the Grace um, acceleration. Hot colors being things that are accelerating, blue, blue being decelerating. Same color scale over here for the GPS, and you can see the vast majority of the GPS sites are hot colors. Um, so out of the 48 that we didn't have polar bears eating them, you've got one, two, three, four, five, uh, what's that? ten. So 38 of the 48 stations are getting faster through time. Ten of them are getting slower. Through time. So Grace is a little misleading, saying you know all the story in Greenland is going to be over here. We've got a mixed-in story, um, just because we have slightly better resolution. So really, we need to come. Uh, GNET is our, our acronym for the GPS, the Greenland network. We need to combine the GPS with altimetry, and with breaks, with surface mass balance measurements, and with results from numerical weather models to really get a handle on how much is dynamics, how much is snowfall, uh, and what Greenland is doing uh, to the sea level. So this is something that I've been doing well at Cornell and well at UNC, which is, I'm, gonna, I'm switching this now to Antarctica. At least one of, you've been doing McMurdo, is that right? You said you were with the guard, or you've been with the airlift? Okay. So you just saw, you saw the jacket, you saw the boots. I'm familiar with it. I'm familiar with um, So in Antarctica, Ross Island is a peninsula that goes out to Ross Island. This is a volcano, and it doesn't look like much of this, because this is the best digital elevation model that we had for the region uh, up until about 10 to 12 years ago. So I'm going to be talking about DEMs, which is just a, a digital representation of uh, topography, and the various sources they come from. But if we get DEMs for the same place at different times, we can remove one from the other and have a look at what rock or ice is being doing. And then I'm making local load models, which I'm going to throw at the GPS and try and get a handle on, on some of those uh, angle variations. So this is a 200 meter resolution. It's called a RAMP DEM, a uh, radar status mapping project DEM. Uh, then this is a 20. You see a little bit more information. You can see kind of a little peninsula coming out here. This is a 20 meter uh, gridded DEM from a laser altimeter that they flew in 2001. Uh, eventually zoom in on the American base there. Then this is what I'm currently working with, which is a three meter DEM. You can see a lot more texture coming in. There's actually an ice tub there. It's, it's kind of hard to see in this light. But we're making this with spy satellite imagery. The, the federal government has arranged it so that people working for federal agencies, NASA, NSF, can get their hands on spy imagery. And when they take two images of the same place, we can make a 3D model of the place. Um, potentially, that can be as good as 1.3 feature postings. I'm doing three just now, just because it's easier to compute. Um, there's a new satellite going up at the end of September, which will take these down to uh, it's 0.24, so it's about 82 centimeter resolution digital elevation models. Just now, this is from effectively half meter imagery. They're going to add, uh, add half quarter meter imagery in this new sample. We can do relative heights very, very well. Uh, if we can correct them, we can do absolute heights very well. You can see things like cracks in sea ice. You can see things like penguins standing around. You can see things like what else is. That's not, you can see the actual animal in the imagery. This is we can create a digital elevation model of a seal or a polar bear or a caribou sitting around on the ice with this stuff. 
So this is not full resolution. Uh, this is the two meter version of the stuff that NASA flew for several million dollars um, down in Antarctica in 2001. They only did little postage stamps everywhere. Uh, the spy agencies have said, well, we're no longer tracking Osama bin Laden, so go for it. We'll take shots of everything you want in the Arctic. So they're blasting in. I get an email from them each weekend saying, well, we collected 450 images for you this week, or 200 images last week. So I then get to go and load up my new computer. I spent $13,500 on hard drives a couple weeks ago. Because <laughs> uh, these things are big. Yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> um, this is what the laser altimeter says McMurdo looks like. You've got fuel storage tanks here. This is the main science building. Here's the, actually, there's the main science building. Here's the galley. You've got the equivalent of college dorms, and it's sometimes like that. It's down here. Um, a crater at the top <coughs> of the hill. The different roads coming out. They have some wind generators up here. Now, so that's two meters that you got from, I said, a couple million dollars worth of input to get that. This is the three meters that could go two meter and a half um, from 770 kilometers away for free. So I'll take the free, thank you very much. Um, again, we can kind of see the buildings that are a bit speared out, but we can see the fuel tanks there. And uh, we got this from 2012, there's the crater again. And then you can Take the new one minus the old one. And, oh, you know, there's your fuel tanks, there's your buildings. Now, this isn't uh, wonderful. What's happening here is the two DEMs are slightly offset. So, once we correct that, a lot of these will disappear. Although, some of them might, if a fuel tank has been built, we'll be able to tell you the volume of the fuel tank because it wasn't there in one image and it is there in the second image. So, but once we co register this, um, these aspects, dependent changes will disappear. So basically this is illustrative, it's, it's junk, but it kind of tells you where we're going. And we plan on doing this for uh, this one. Yep, yeah. so this is a Greenland glacier at three meters as well. And you can see the glacier coming down here and all the icebergs coming off the front of the glacier. This isn't a picture, this is a topography. So this is heights. Um, so it's, it's spectacularly accurate and we get into problems when if we do a difference with this and the glacier has moved a bit, what was a crevasse is now a ridge between a crevasse. And so we have to sort out, <coughs> is this actual thinning or is it just a crevasse moving through our, through our imagery? Um, but I started building these for Groom. We have lots of these for the Russian Arctic. Um, we have potential to get them for Patagonia. We're getting them for uh, Antarctica. We've tasked them to do stuff for Alaska. So uh, hopefully we'll just be getting more and more and more of these in a production mode so we can start doing these elastic corrections. Some other things, this is the last slide. Um, some other things that go point. This is when our wind generators are not regulated <laughs> or charge the batteries. And so I think it's got this weird problem. I never thought of it when I, when I first went down there which is, uh, it's so dry. Highest, driest, coldest continent, windiest continent. But it's so dry that you constantly got these ice particles zooming past you. And people, when I come back from Antarctica, I'm always going to doors, hitting them with the back of my hand before I grab the door handle because the static shocks you get there are obscene. They really <laughs> hurt. So it's, then I open a door. <laughs> You've got overcharged batteries. Overcharged batteries like to vent hydrogen. You put a static shock on there. So this is a Antarctic site. This is um, so this is quarter-inch steel tubing with pretty hefty stuff. That the these are OSHA regulated for building scaffolding when they're building up a building. Snapped just because of the wind. Uh, there's another one. And then the other thing that goes blank is plates. Uh, Everyone walked away from this one, thankfully, apart from the mechanic who uh, broke his ankle after the fact. So this plane crashed with our T1 board about 700 miles from Alberta. Uh, it touched a wing, messed up the props, 
put a hole in it, the plate was a two and a half feet shorter than it was than when it first started taxiing by the time it ended taxiing. But the mechanic was bored and uh, they said it's going to take us ten, 10 hours to come and rescue you from your crash. So he built a jump and he had a good go at the jump with his snowmobile and it landed on his ankle. <laughs> <laughs> Point. <laughs> uh, uh, that's the end of my, my talk for now. Thanks so much. <laughs>